the idea of this um, this panel conversation is to sort of like uh, move a bit beyond the principle question. So uh, not claiming new restrictions on public domain works is, is, is slowly becoming the norm. Uh, norm. I, I guess we can uh, sort of discuss about that, but that, that's certainly something we've, we've been seeing is becoming the norm at institutions uh, in Flanders. It's also becoming the norm uh, at the government. The government is also asking for that more and more. Uh, so this time we decided to focus uh, on the how and why, not as a principal question, but more uh, uh, in terms of practical strategy. Um, so how do you actively facilitate creative reuse? And for this, uh, we have invited uh, Sophie Teugels from Collections of Ghent, Dieter Sulz from uh, Fashion Museum of Antwerp, Diethard Vlaming from Koers, and Olivier van Duinslager from the Design Museum of Ghent. So uh, what we asked them is uh, to prepare a small lightning uh, presentation to show you uh, what uh, they have been working on uh, in terms of uh, facilitating reuse. Uh, and we'll uh, go through their uh, presentations first and then we'll uh, start the conversation. So I, I propose that um, I will uh, move the slides and you just tell me uh, when, to, when to move. So um, Sophie, can you uh, share your uh, camera? Yes, my camera is on, I think. Hi, everybody. Um, Sam, I only have one slide, so it's easy. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for the introduction, Sam. Um, hello, my name is Sophie. I work for Collections of Ghent, Collectie van de Gentenaar in Dutch. Uh, and I'm here today to tell you something about how we stimulate uh, the reuse of uh, digitized cultural heritage data. So um, Collections of Ghent uh, works with six collections. Uh, we have the five collections of our content partners who are uh, Archief Ghent, Design Museum Ghent, Huis van Alleen, Industrie Museum and Stam. And we have the sixth collection that is composed uh, of the input of citizens. Um, and apart from uh, breaking open the data silos uh, by linking and structuring the data, and creating digital platforms that reach out to uh, new audiences. Collections of Ghent also stimulates uh, the reuse of uh, the collection data. And for this, we created a couple of instruments, namely uh, the web platform, uh, Cultural Data Lab and uh, the Co-Creation Fund. Um, so the first uh, instrument is the web platform. Um, I put the link uh, on my slide, data.collectie.gent. And uh, the web platform collects uh, the data of the six uh, collections and uh, the data when published on the platform uh, is linked, uh, structured and open, rights clearance included. And in the data preparation, uh, the cultural heritage institutions are supported uh, by the data team. So um, every institution has one full time employee for the duration of the project to attend uh, to the data. Uh, and regarding rights clearance, uh, the data team and institutions uh, are working on a workflow and I'm happy to say that we agreed on some uh, basic points when starting rights clearance. Uh, for example, to determine copyright, uh, the object is a starting point, uh, not a digital reproduction. So um, it's an open call if you are also working on a workflow or risk analysis concerning rights. Uh, clearance, I'm very uh, open to share um, our findings and experience uh, so far. Um, and I'm also uh, very interested in how other institutions manage rights clearance. So please contact me if you want to talk shop. I put my uh, mail address also uh, on the slide. Uh, so uh, the web platform uh, facilitates uh, the findability, the searchability and usability of the data. So everybody interested in reusing the data can go to one platform that aggregates uh, all six collections. So that's the first instrument. Uh, the second instrument is the Cultural Data Lab. And that um, during the first half of the project, the Cultural Data Lab focused on uh, knowledge sharing. For example, together with Memo, we organized a copyright lecture. Um, and in the second half of the project, uh, which is actually starting uh, now, the Cultural Data Lab will focus more on uh, sharing inspiring examples of data reuse uh, by organizing workshops, uh, for example, hackathons, and uh, webinars. So that is uh, the second instrument. And then the third instrument is the co-creation fund. And uh, the co-creation fund reserves 200,000 euros for interested parties that want to reuse the data. 
So anybody really uh, with a good idea of creative or technological reuse can apply. Uh, and the fund provides a minimum of 2,000 euros and a maximum of 20,000 euros uh, per project. So this is a financial stimulus uh, to reuse the data. And uh, applications are still open until mid-March. So if you are curious or interested, please check our website or uh, contact, contact me. Um, and um, I also want to add, so apart from these um, uh, three instruments, um, I, I see in the chat, we also have a linked data event stream, of course, um, that is, um, thank you <laughs> for sharing, that is um, um, particularly um, an interest for people who want to um, do the technological reuse. Uh, so the link data event stream is, uh, you can actually see it as a base API that you can use to create a technological reuse of our data. Um, and to uh, conclude, so we have three instruments, but I also want to add that um, within the project of Cohent, we also, uh, we do put a lot of uh, human effort as well into the stimulation of data reuse. Uh, we have a team of field workers who are present in the neighborhoods, uh, who are contacting people and directing them to the co-creation fund, the cultural data lab, our web platform, who are organizing all sorts of activities to engage people in reusing uh, cultural heritage, um, but also to make them aware of their own cultural heritage. So for collections of Ghent, it's uh, the combination. So the stimulation of reuse is the combination of um, the instruments and uh, the efforts of a dedicated team uh, that act actively reaches out um, to the audience. So this is in short uh, how Collections of Ghent uh, stimulates uh, the reuse of the data. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, Sophie. I guess then we'll, we will move on to uh, at the course um, by the presentation of uh, Dieter Vlaming. Dietard, sorry, can you uh, share your screen? Um, if it's all right, um, I have only three slides, so if you could uh, go through them, it would be great. Okay, we will do. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Dietard Flaming, and I work for Kurs Museum of Cycle Racing in uh, Ruslare, or in Dutch, Kurs Museum of Wheelersports. Uh, and last year we launched uh, a new website, Service Kurs. Uh, which main goal is uh, to display uh, cycling collections, uh, not just ours, but also those of uh, collectors, uh, other institutions, if there is any interest, uh, and to share them broadly with uh, the public. We also want to showcase our research uh, and facilitate uh, people to do their own. Um, the main thing we want to achieve is uh, to have people reuse our own collection. For example, last week uh, we got a question from a manufacturer or a butcher who wanted to use some images of our own uh, in their branding and we are more than happy uh, to oblige. But we've noticed that we still have a long way to go, which is actually our main challenge is to get a platform out there and to uh, get more people excited to use it and to start uh, reusing um, our content. Uh, right now we are looking at uh, linking with other platforms. Um, this one is uh, on the next slide. Uh, we are right now looking at ways uh, to link with other platforms, for example, uh, Wikipedia, Wikimedia, uh, but also to invest more in social media as most of our users uh, our, our interest in public is uh, there. And of course, to invest more in multilingual uh, content, content um, but we are all ears for uh, more ideas on how we can improve this, um, as this is a very young uh, project. Uh, we, there's still uh, a lot of growth uh, potential. Okay, thank you very much, Dietard, uh, for your talk. Also, um, uh, a course has already uploaded uh, actually uh, some sets of images on uh, Wikimedia Commons. And actually, um, if you check on the Glam Wiki dashboard, uh, you can uh, check the view, the views on that collection. Actually, it's 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 rather a lot that shows that there's very much a very global audience uh, for a, uh, a regional museum. 
Um, okay, so then uh, we'll move on to uh, the Fashion Museum with uh, Dieter Sulz. Dieter, can you uh, share your screen? Okay. Hello, uh, thanks for having me, Sam. Um, I would like to say something about uh, a bit of an experiment we did um, a couple of months ago called a Paternathon. So the idea was to um, invite a community of, of creators, of makers, of designers, and have them um, create patterns of a historical collection of the museum called the study collection, which is available in the reading room. Can you next slide, please? So uh, first step we did is we uploaded uh, a selection of these uh, of this collection, the 30, 40 objects. We uploaded the images of them into uh, Wikimedia Commons. Uh, we invited then uh, people over and uh, also made the selection of objects available in the reading room. And what we did is we asked them to make a pattern and also contribute or donate the pattern uh, to uh, Wikimedia Commons so it would be there for reuse. Because we know that there's a there's a big community for people recreating costume or or reinterpreting costume. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, the idea behind the paternathon was to build further on 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 formats such as an editathon, which is a, a kind of an editing session for Wikipedia. But we thought perhaps we can achieve the same thing, but then with uh, patterns of of or costume. Um, the source for this uh, event was the study collection, which is uh, a collection of about 2000 objects we make available um, in our uh, museum, but as a resource for direct consultation. So it's in our reading room, you can not only access books, but you can also access uh, museum objects. Um, the event targeted targeted uh, the creative reuse of this collection. So um, we just we don't want to only make it available for researchers but also creative reuse has to be one of the targets for this collection uh, and we collaborated for this together with the University of Antwerp Department of uh, of Conservation and Restoration Studies that uh, supported us uh, methodolo methodologically uh, in the sense that they uh, they they did a small workshop on how you make a pattern of a historical costume and how do you share these things um, we were also supported um, by, uh, by the Citizen Heritage Project, which is a project um, um, valorizing citizen science, uh, and they supported supported us with communication, but also they gave us some tools to to work with us. They 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 bought us some uh, rulers and patterns, paper and stuff like that. So we had a small cost. They took care of it, uh, and the Citizen Heritage Project is managed by KU Leuven, Europeana. Fashion Heritage Association and then the Erasmus University. Um, so I think the, the 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 result of this one uh, time event was 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 interesting. So we, what we want to do now is to learn to do it again, repeat and learn from it because since it was a new thing, we don't have a we don't have a guidelines yet to how you you make it happen. And one of the the main thing is that we we want to make sure that the outputs of this uh, paternathon has to be the correct input for the creative reuse of the collection. So um, so once you have uh, people making patterns, how do you share the patterns? Which metadata is necessary? Uh, which platforms do you use? Um, so just let's say make a picture of a, of, a, of, a, of a part of a pattern is not enough. You have to do different things. So we have to learn and, and see with the community how what's the best results uh, or how what's the best way to share uh, what, what they have created. Um, another thing that we want to do is to create guidelines um, so that this uh, paternathon could also be set up at another place for other people with another collection. Um, and the result of everything has to be we want to build a community of makers and create a corpus of openly licensed patterns uh, through sharing via Wikimedia Commons. Voila. Okay, thank you very much, Dieter. Uh, I think this is a super good example of an institution realizing that uh, you know what what they are used to doing, usually uh, sharing an image or a reproduction uh, of a work, is is perhaps not what uh, a certain uh, reuse community actually needs. So I think it's uh, it's very interesting, and I'm looking forward to see what uh, your ongoing experimentation will yield. Uh, and then we uh, this brings us to the uh, last. Uh, presentation uh, of uh, Olivier van Duinslager uh, will say something about the, his work at the Design Museum Ghent. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Sam. 
Um, maybe a bit different from the previous three um, lightning talks. Um, we are at the brink of closure. So in March, um, the De Design Museum in Ghent will close its doors um, till uh, summer of 2024. Um, this also gives us a lot of opportunity to think about our collection website and the collection um, online. And maybe I just want to share more a vision than um, a realization of a project. Um, we believe that it's important uh, for designers today who want to design the present and of course also the future. But they also must know um, their past. Um, and this uh, picture shows how back in 1903, when the museum was established um, by the Association of Industrial and the decor uh, decorative arts, um, it was more conceived as a models museum. Um, so it collected goods, good examples of crafts and trade, and uh, saw its main public role to inspire um, artists and craftsmen. Um, it, it was, if, if you look at the, the patterns on the walls, it's almost a kind of uh, linked open data um, avant la lettre. And, and that's why almost 120 years later now, we are researching how this model or how this museum model can inform us um, and inform us on our new collection presentation and uh, it will be opened in 2024 with a new wing, not only on site, but also online and, and all hybrid encounters um, in between. Um, maybe the next slides. Um, so as a museum, we also realize that there's only so much we can say, there's only so much we can we can show. And we need to figure out how we can leverage um, other interfaces and other types of interfaces. And I think also Dieter uh, talked about this. You can show, you can share patterns, but it's also thinking about what interfaces are necessary to really uh, engage with this kind of context. Uh, context. Um, and, and in the same way, we also need to think about how can we um, create interfaces that allow for other voices to appear and to be heard and included. This has a lot to do with participation and inclusion. And to do so as a design museum, we really want to engage with our peers. So ranging from young designers, young design graduates to the to dynamic designers working in the field of system interface and or information design, and even allow for uh, more speculative forms of, of design to enter the online realm or the hybrid realm um, of the museum. So we don't only want to rework the data, but also rethink the system and the interfaces through which these are accessed online. And in that way, we want the online collection to become a playground, a breeding ground, a sensing layer for what is and what isn't happening um, around us. And maybe to conclude, the Design Museum doesn't really envision a Creative Commons only as a means to promote creative reuse, but also as a way um, to question how digital culture in our case, design is both produced, distributed, distributed, and circulates in a post-internet age. Thank you, Sam. All right, thank you, Olivier, for uh, sharing your uh, vision on what a design museum uh, is supposed to do with this digital collection. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. All right, could all the uh, panelists please um, uh, turn on their microphone and camera? Perfect. All right, Sophie. Um, my camera is on. Oh, you okay. Don't see me? That's just my screen now. <laughs> all right, perfect. Um, so uh, thank you all for sharing like uh, something about your practice or your vision on uh, what a heritage institution can do to actively uh, facilitate reuse. Um, so I'm going to launch into my first question. So. Um, uh, it's still COVID-19 uh, period, so I think something that uh, we've all been thinking about is that the restrictions in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been, in a way, the perfect test case to see whether the heritage sector was digital, digitally mature to serve its audience uh, online. So um, do you believe that the Belgian heritage institutions in general uh, were ready for this uh, pandemic? Was your institution ready for this pandemic? Uh, are there previous um, uh, efforts that you've made that you've seen are really per paying off now? And um, if not, did you change priorities during the pandemic um, to better uh, um, reach your audiences? These are a lot of questions, but uh, I thought uh, maybe first to uh, start with uh, Olivier. Um, 
were we ready for the pandemic? I, I think mm -hmm. Anyone was ready for this or was expecting this? Um, I think what was important for us is that we realized that we didn't really have a platform to or an online platform to engage uh, with our audience. Um, we did have the social media channels and those appeared to be very important as also Dithard mentioned, um, but to really use these, uh, our collection online also meant that we had to clear our copyrights, uh, um, applied rights statements because they wanted to make hips out of them. They want to really creative uh, reuse them and, and that was I think it's a bit daunting um, to do this. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, uh, Dieter, uh, the fashion museum had already actually prior been closed for several years. So in, in a way you were already dealing with this. Uh, so do you think that, that the, the, the fashion museum somehow was, uh, was prepared for, for this situation? Uh, no, <laughs> very <laughs> sure. Um, no, uh, we we took the, the 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 past years mainly to work on the on on the back end and on the back office to 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 try to reorganize our our, our collection in the best possible way by uh, working with the digital asset management system, also working in behind the screens uh, in our archives. In, uh, we also worked on an external depot, so our our focus the past year has been very internally um but we hope uh in the next year we will turn more outwards and 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 make the collection more available um also because of the work that we prepared during our, our closing mm -hmm. yeah. okay well yeah that's definitely something that i've i've seen reflected in the the early um uh webinars or uh, things that were conversations that were happening between institutions that uh, people are talking about all their front office activities like oh yeah we, we've switched to social media um but uh, obviously there's also uh yeah back office work that you need to do in order to give people access to your collections um but maybe we can we can um move with this question to to detail because um actually your museum uh, is a, 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 a regional uh, museum uh, located a bit decentral and, and you are already before the, the, the COVID period you're already realizing that actually you have a, a collection that, that, that has a potential digital like um, uh, global reach digitally because a lot of people are, are, are very interested in your collections but uh, but you're a regional museum so um, is that something that sort of uh, uh made you a bit more um able to deal with um the COVID uh situation um we started our shift towards digital um back in 2017-2018 um when we applied for new funds for the museum that we only got to work uh, on them or start experimenting at the end of 2019 a couple of months uh, before uh, Corona hits everybody. Uh, so we weren't as prepared as we hoped we were. Uh, we had a lot of content, we had a lot of uh, information. Uh, we tried to put out there um, mainly through social media, but our back office, um, everything to do with registration data, um, we were still looking at it and still trying to figure out how we uh, could implement a good process, how, to, how we could uh, make everything uh, run more smoothly. Um, and on some parts, we are still uh, looking at how we uh, can do better uh, towards the future. Uh, but I think uh, the main thing from Corona was uh, at least the first couple of months that we were already working on a digital strategy uh, on uh, finding our own voice and looking at how we can uh, open up our collections, um, what uh, were necessary steps to take. And those first few months where we could exper experiment or were forced to experiment heavily uh, on social outreach uh, through social media or other platforms were um, a gift uh, in, a, in a sort of way uh, because we could uh, take it back to uh, the digital strategy that we were uh, writing at the time. Okay, okay, that's interesting how you uh, managed to shift priorities. Actually, that brings me to uh, to Sophie because 
uh, your project, uh, Collectie van de Gentenaar, Collections of Ghent, is very much premised on um, yes, increasing the, the, the main object is not just uh, opening up digital collections, but that in doing so, you increase social cohesion. So I can imagine that um, uh, COVID must have been a, a, a issue uh for the project can you tell us something about that and then how you um how you adapted uh yeah <laughs> um like i was saying before um we have a few instruments uh, to stimulate reuse but there's also a very a, a big human effort um a big human part in in this and of course, yes, we were uh, affected by COVID. Um, the field workers, they were uh, not able to do all the activity, activities that they wanted to do. Um, and also, um, even though you, you have a web uh, platform and even though um, the uh, people will be stimulated to add their own collections, um, if you cannot reach them in person, if you cannot um, um, yeah, reach them. Um, if you cannot make this human effort, um, it's still it's still very hard um, to um, to engage people um, in the project. So yes, we were uh, affected by COVID nineteen mm -hmm. for sure. <laughs> I'm sure we all were. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, well, let's move to the the next question. So. Um, how do you decide which, uh, this is maybe one where we start, start with Dietrich, so how do you decide which audiences you want to uh, focus on serving and how did you find them? Like maybe you can start specifically for the Paternathon, where did the idea come from? Uh, was it from from the institution or did, did the researcher come to you or uh, some a re reuser? Actually the, the um... What I also mentioned earlier that that uh, that we worked on the back office, uh, um, um, we also realized that that a big part of our collection will never be available uh, for an audience. Yeah. Um, but on the same time, because of the study collection, that the, the so um, first let's let's sketch a bit. We we are we we have reorganized our collection in the in the way that we have now. An external depot, which means that most uh, of our collection is not easily available anymore, even to our own staff, because it's uh, stored externally somewhere in the port of Antwerp. Um, but at the same time, we thought we, we have to provide a resource that's more accessible for an audience. So the idea of the study collection emerged. It's it's it emerged already five ten years ago. Uh, uh, but the moment it was it was ready, we we had to close the museum because of renovation works. Um, and now, unfortunately, we have closed again for renovation works. Uh, some minor tweaking to do, but anyhow, that's another story. Um, but once we reopened, we thought, okay, we have here now this study collection. Um, how do we work with this? Who will we attract? Uh, how will will people engage with it? Um, and on the one hand, you have very um, students, they always come up. We we work in the same building as the, the fashion academy, so uh, also other fashion academies from 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 Belgium, Netherlands, they all find their way. But we also thought we we also want to work together with the creative community that's also around in Antwerp or 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 in Belgium. Um, and let's say as a way to trigger them, we we thought a, a paternaton would be an, an interesting um, um, concept. It was also for us an experiment, so we also didn't know when we invited or we said when we sent out an email um, um, asking for people to come and to contribute, whether we would find them or not. But it was uh, immediately we, we found a lot of re response from from people um, working in the fashion industry, people that uh, work in conservation industry, people that uh, teach, people that also from a hobby perspective do those kind of things. Um, so um, the main goal for us was to stimulate another kind of usage of that study collection um, and, and, and to have as a result of that engagement something for the creative community. So it was kind of a bit of a, um, uh, I don't know, some kind of a, uh, an idea that, that emerged and we thought let's, let's see if, we can, if we, can, we can make it work, if we can find people. Uh, and we were very fortunate that we did. And e actually, we had to close down the, the subscriptions and we have three, four times oversubscribed uh, for the event. So we're very happy that, that, that we will 
let's say next time we will find new people, new um, a new community to 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 create stuff. Um, and then also uh, Wikimedia um, has been a very interesting platform because we already uploaded some images uh, and some drawings and stuff like that on Wikimedia. And when you see the 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 the, the statistics of of the usage, it's it's, it's really uh, absurd. The, the you get millions of users um, by by just uploading um, images on, on on Wikimedia. So we also thought, okay, this could be an interesting platform. So we combined a bit all those different uh, uh, elements and came up with the idea of a paternaton. And yeah, it let's say from a first experiment, we could say it worked. Okay. That's very interesting. I thought it was also interesting that, that you say that proximity is is even when you're doing digital stuff and you may also be serving uh, a global audience, that the fact that the students are close um, and that you can really work together and think together is is, is a good thing. Uh, Dietrich, can, can you say something about that? Um, because um, you also uploaded some stuff on Wikimedia um, platforms and it's, it's seeing, I think, um, uh, it, it also um, gathers a lot of international interest. Uh, yes, uh, we've um, uploaded, I think, uh, right now around uh, six or seven hundred pictures. Uh, some of them object pictures, others uh, are pictures taken during uh, races. Uh, we've linked them to uh, the Wikipedia pages itself uh, so that they are more visible and that they attract a broader audience. And right now we've noticed that, uh, for example, when uh, the Tour de France is written uh, during the summer months, uh, those pictures garner more attraction. Um, I think uh, those are also, or uh, when it comes down to visibility, our most important months. Uh, we get around 700,000 views a month, which is uh, quite nice. Uh, during the winter, it's much less. It's around uh, 50 or 70. Um, so it's really important that the things uh, we publish are uh, linked to the linked to the news, uh, things people see or hear about. Um, and we've noticed that when it comes down to Wikipedia, it's more or less always researchers or people who are curious who want to learn something more. Uh, and when it comes down to, uh, for example, service crews, it's more the uh, people who look who are more interested, who want to more uh, to know uh, more specific details, who want to dive deeper into uh, our content. OK, so do I get correct that you, you on the one hand, uh, in order to capture uh, that, like th those views on Wikipedia, you have to have your collection out there and then maybe some event will happen with, that gathers interest for something. But at the same time, you, you also uh, get specific questions from people that need something. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, I think uh, last month or a couple of months ago, uh, we got specific questions from uh, an English uh, broadcasting network who wanted to use some of our pictures on uh, Wikimedia Commons uh, and wanted to know more something more um, about the bikes in question. Okay. That's so really really nice way to open up your collection. Okay. Um, Olivia, maybe you can say something. I, I, I know you, you just said that you were very like early in this uh, in this reflection, maybe. But uh, at the same time, uh, your institution is also very close to uh, uh, to design schools, uh, so there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, can you say something about that? Mm -hmm. and, and of course, I mean um, that's also one of the reasons why we um, initiated the whole Collections of Gans project to really try and find out what's living in the city and, and get a grasp of what the role of the design museum might be in that. But what I was thinking about even um, in the earlier question is that how much we, we were not prepared and it still reflects on us today um, based on or, or, or in means of the the content we have today, um, we are very much focused on registering all these facts and all these data very meticulously, but it's not always the most interesting content. It's not um, narrative, it's not telling a story. And that's of course the kind of content that people are expecting to see mainly on these or, or on these um, social media platforms. And that takes a lot of time. You need to 
write them, you need to translate it into different languages. And so I think in a sense, targeting the right groups, uh, being designers or, or creative communities, even creative industry, is also in parts about, I think, content negotiation, what content is interesting for them, and how can this, this dialogue between us as the museum and, and them as maybe the reusers, how can that also be informative um, for us? And I think it's it's in, in, in that sense, it's also very much about creating new kinds of relationships um, to become relevant as a museum, to become relevant as an institution beyond the main um, museum practices of just displaying uh, the collection. I think online and Creative Commons and public domain and Wikimedia are very nice tools to do so, but we still need to ensure that proximity because Wikidata and Wikimedia Commons can also feel very far off from the actual institution and how can we re-establish this dynamic. Um, I think that's something very important to um, be aware of uh, in the near future. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it's much easier for um, for say like for, for detail to is working or it's not easier. I don't want to be disrespectful, but if if you work on a subject like KUS, which is very uh, lively and very, a lot of people are very passionate about this culture. So they feel very, very close to the to the actual museum. If you work in for say in the design museum, it can uh, um, very quickly feel uh, autant or or um, these these very uh, expensive products. But design is uh, much broader than that, and how can we open up that uh, dialogue as well? Um, because it's also part of our um, main culture today. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe there's uh, something to to be said for uh, uh, sort of exporting the um, study collection uh, idea of the fashion museum uh, to other contexts or something to to integrate um, to give more of a space and and. Uh, uh, a um, sustainable connection with uh, these kind of uh, uh, students or uh, reusers. If okay. I can say something yeah. about that, some <laughs> uh, from <laughs> collections of Ghent, um, it's also I talked about uh, the sixth collection. So that's also uh, one of the um, the aims of the project mm -hmm. to engage people more to make them aware of their own cultural heritage and to give them an opportunity to add their uh, heritage to the collections. So uh, in order to uh, really strengthen the relationship between the citizens and the, and the museum uh, and the cultural instit heritage institutions um, so that they come closer and uh, people uh, feel that they are um, represented by the institutions. Um, so that's also um, something we are working on uh, in, the, in collections of Ghent. Mm -hmm. And maybe if I could just add one more thing, we're also we're very much talking about the reusers outside of the institutions, but I think we're also reusers of each other's mm -hmm. institution of the work we are doing. For example, we are now trying to um, incorporate the the, the fashion tesoris that that has been built by the the fashion museum, and it's very informative for us. And in a way, it connects both collections, and maybe it can become inspiring to do projects in the near future on patterns or on stuff like that. And then we. Uh, broaden our audience um, in, in a more uh, collaborative uh, fashion because I think many of the audiences that go to the fashion museum are maybe also interested in, in design and vice versa but maybe they don't find the right entryway uh, to both institutions so I think there's a lot of potential in that as well. It's nice to hear Olivier. <laughs> <laughs> okay um, maybe we can move to the next question so um, uh, yeah, so uh, we are always um, involved or always at, at a certain stage at a certain project or, or executing uh, uh, this project or that. Um, but what is like the right time to start the reflection on which audiences you want to uh, choose? Like, do you begin before or after setting up like a new uh, architecture for sharing digital collections, or is it an iterative thing? And uh, if so, how do you how do you future proof uh, your uh, your your uh, digital infrastructure for that? Um, maybe uh, we could start with uh, Sophie, because Collections of Ghent is a project. So mm -hmm. maybe you can say something about that. Yeah. Um, well. 
in the beginning of the project, there were um, three neighborhoods selected in Ghent. So um, uh, to give a little context, uh, we also uh, make a, a physical box and we will land in those three neighborhoods with a box. So um, in first, uh, at first instance, the people who live in those neighborhoods are the target audience because they can expect the box and they will be um, actively approached by uh, the field workers. Um, secondly, in the creation of the uh, infrastructure, it is um, um, iterative because um, we also uh, work together with the University of Ghent, uh, who do um, uh, public research. Um, they, um, they, they look for test audiences. Um, they test uh, the development of the infrastructure with uh, the audience. They give feedback. So this is all... Um, um, taken into consideration um, in the development of the infrastructure. Um, and then, um, lastly, I think uh, there are in the um, partner institutions, there are digital um, strategists. Um, there, there are also um, data um, employees. So we uh, try to engage them as well uh, in order to ensure that they will um, they will be using the infrastructure after the project is done. So, um, but we start, um, if you talk about the target audience, we start with the three neighborhoods um, to um, actively approach them um, and, and try to engage them in reusing the data and in the activities and so forth. Okay. And then the 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 end point of this uh, traveling box, actually the, the box is a, uh, digital yeah. experience environment uh, where the digital collections can be seen mm -hmm. um, would be the design museum so uh, so in fact the there is a uh, durability um, uh, consideration in there um, which brings us to the design museum um, Olivier do, do you have something to say about this uh, uh, about this question um, yeah maybe very shortly I, I believe that uh, technology is a tool and, and a tool needs to be used and for it to be used it needs to be useful um, and I think it's much um, I think you just need to start from from a, a real life um, problem and then start thinking what technology can be used to solve this problem and not just build the technology and hope that the solution will come um, I think that's a major pitfall um, it's also something we noticed with the, the early implementations of linked data. Everybody published all their data out there, but then nothing happened with it because there was no use case for it or there were no people who were doing actually doing something with it. So if you have an active community, uh, maybe it's uh, much easier to try and um, help the things you're already doing by building technological um, infrastructure for them or tools for them, um, I think. It's more durable in the long run. Okay, interesting. Um, and that brings us maybe to um, my final question. So uh, a lot has been made about this explosion of creativity that access to public domain artworks uh, could cause, actually. Uh, but is it perhaps a bit naive to expect that um, this will just happen uh, without uh, actively facilitating reuse, uh, maybe a, a bit what you were uh, getting at, Olivier. But um, yeah, if you if you want to actively facilitate reuse, then uh, how much of a yeah? What is your experience of the cost benefit ratio of the projects you've been working on? Um, is this something that is part of your job? Um, is, is it in your job description? Is there somebody at your institution that uh, has like dedicated time for this? And do you think that there will be more uh, roles at museum in the future uh, for actively creating engagement with uh, with the collection digitally or otherwise? Um, maybe we can start with uh, with Dieter. Okay. Um, well. Um, I'm quite fortunate that uh, in our museum, innovation is one uh, of element that that's valued highly. So that allows me not to be micromanaged by my director. So that's that's a good thing. 
Um, and I think it's, let's say, the experimentation, it's, it's, all, it's all a matter of scale. I think if you can do things easily on a small scale without much costs, without investing too much time in it, and it's successful, okay, great, do it. Um, if if the experiment is 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 is, is, uh, is much more costly, then you have to think really hard before before doing it. But I think it's a combination of 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 of, of, of elements. Well, on the one thing, it's, it's it's strategy. On another, on, on on the other hand, it's 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 opportunities, things that you see happening. It's also being close to 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 your users, and 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 understanding what what triggers them, what drives them. I think also as a museum. On the one hand, you, you have, let's say, an authoritative function in which you, let's say, disseminate your content in your own cur curatorial way and, 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 and make a nice product out of it, like, let's say, an exhibition. But on the other hand, you have a, an obligation to, to, let's say, to, to unlock the full potential of, of, of your collection and make it available for as many types of usage as possible. Um, and... For me, something like um, Wikimedia Commons has been a very good platform to make content available because there you have a huge amount of people using it, seeing it. For example, the the thesaurus that uh, uh, Olivier referred to. Also, let's say it, 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 one of the starting points was a was a, um, a set of drawings that we asked to illustrate the thesaurus. We made it available on Wikimedia Commons. Then we had our own thesaurus. And then people start to match it with the ART. So if 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 you if you have your content on a popular platform, um, reuse automatically starts. I think it's not. Yeah, it's a bit <laughs> my theory. Mm. Okay, uh, Sophie, you are in the I guess with the project in an, uh, a rather fortunate position that the project itself creates it gives uh, allocates resources to. Mm -hmm. Uh, initiate creative reuse. Can you say something more about that? Um, yes, so uh, you mean the co-creation fund? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, we have uh, the co-creation fund. It's uh, 200,000 euros that um, we uh, have available for uh, interested parties uh, who have an ID to reuse uh, our data. Uh, it can be creative uh, reuse, so uh, artists, uh, filmmakers, um, uh, musicians, uh, or it can be technological uh, reuse, um, more uh, digital uh, makers. Um, so um, they can apply, they can uh, apply for uh, the funding and they um, can have a minimum of 2,000 euros per project or a ma maximum of 20,000 euros per project. And in that way, we hope to really stimulate um, people to do something with our data because all the data that is available on our web platform is um, is linked and open and um, the rights are uh, cleared. They have a, a right statement or they, they are in public domain. So um, all the contact, uh, content on our web platform is available for reuse. Um, and we hope that um, uh, so the, the application um, period is still running so we at this point we have no idea what kind of ideas uh, of reuse uh, that uh, will um, um, will happen but we do hope that uh, that some ideas uh, are very good and that also the institutions will see uh, what is um, what is possible with uh, linked open data how you can reuse it and we really hope that um, it can ins inspire our content partners uh, but also other uh, other uh, institutions to um, to to open up their their data and to and to use it for whatever creative technological use is possible. Okay, um, thank you. Maybe finally, um, well, Olivier, since you started uh, your lightning talk with more of a sort of a, a broad uh, idea of what um, you know museums should should work towards and your museum should work towards do you think it's 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 feasible it's realistic for a uh, medium-sized museum like the the design museum of ghent to employ somebody who who is for instance uh would be like who would be like a, a digital curator or um or a digital facilitator or 
I mean, why not? I think it's what Dieter already said. It's it's about mm -hmm. a matter of scale, and I also believe that digital will become normative within the institution, and we will no longer think about um, curating online versus. Uh, or I mean, okay, the, 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 there will still be a difference, but the reflex of of um, everything will also have will always have an online or a digital um, thing att attached to it, and maybe. We don't necessarily need someone curating uh, on premise, but working together with designers and with students who do it for us, um, it can be equally um, as informative. Mm. Okay, and I just uh, add one thing to that. I think it's also important that you value the digital visitor as much as you as yeah. value the, the the physical visitor. And as long as this is not the case, probably a medium-sized museum mm. will will make it it will be very hard for them to have a digital curator there mm. but once you actually mm -hmm. value the digital visitor i think it makes a lot of sense to to also curate your collection in a digital realm okay maybe that brings me to a to a final question to wrap it all up um do you find it easy to quantify digital engagement um as much as as physical engagement Dieter, maybe uh, since you brought it up. Yeah. I think the, the other way to phrase what I just said is no, <laughs> we don't do it. And that's one of the problems, I think. OK. Somebody else has an experience with uh, quantifying digital engagement that they would like to share. I think there are many tools mm -hmm. by which you can do that for a website, Google Analytics, for Wikipedia or Wikimedia Commons. Uh, the Glam dashboards uh, or other glamorous, uh, the glamorous tool, for example. Uh, but it's one thing uh, to have the data and the numbers of how many people uh, watch uh, the collection online. And it's another thing to uh, put them towards a board or um, towards the government and show them for, and this is from our case, we are, uh, as you put it, Sam, uh, the Central Museum, um, we don't, we have uh, a lot of visitors uh, who visit us physically, uh, but we have a much bigger uh, or much bigger potential digitally. But it's very difficult uh, to translate that potential, even with numbers, uh, towards uh, our government, municipal, uh, or otherwise, uh, to we get them to realize how much potential there is uh, when it comes down to uh, digital stuff. Okay. Well, thank you very much for weighing in. Uh, then I think I will close this uh, this panel conversation and uh, thank you very much for uh, being part of it, um, all of you. And then it brings.